colleagues, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, which is the traditional webinar greeting. Um, apologies, we've started a couple of minutes late, but as you know, we've had significant interest with uh, in this particular webinar, and we were waiting for colleagues to actually sign in. So greetings and, and, and welcome uh, to this webinar on Right to Health, uh, Public Health and Climate Change. Um, this is first, you know, webinar series we're considering on right-based approaches to health, and it's important for good public health policy and practice. Uh, this webinar has been organized by the Faculty of Public Health in collaboration with the Office for High Commissioner for Human Rights Geneva, Global Network, uh, Global Network Academic Public Health, European Public Health Association, and a range of other partners as a collaborative effort uh, around the issue. Colleagues, I, 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 as you saw in, in, in one of the opening uh, slides while you were waiting, um, the world is in, is in turmoil and there's clear need to better understand, appreciate the human rights values and approaches to health and the ongoing conversations to advance this particular issues in action. Therefore, the high level commission uh, meet high high level meeting in Urcha Marsh, which you saw as an earlier slide, is a very, very high level meeting of Director General Dr. Tedros and the Office for the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, to have a conversation around this. But the real conversations need to be also includes people like us, public health and legal professionals and so on, to help to put all this stuff into praxis. I think it's highly pertinent that this first webinar is actually around climate change, uh, since it is a major, major, major issue. And uh, future, our grandchildren, future historians, why, why on earth are we sitting on our hands, letting our, destroying our planet and our people? The background to this uh, webinar series is in July 2023, 20 Professor Ryan, Reinhard Huss wrote to the Faculty of Public Health that Lynn Gentile and her colleagues in Office of Human Rights were interested to have some awareness raising on rights-based approaches to health and interest to work with the faculty and schools of public health and other health institutions around this issue. This very much coincided with interests of the Faculty of Public Health and other institutions wanting to build competence and capacity of the public health workforce and the health workforce around their issue. It was interesting that I noted in the email from Lynn who shared, and you know how you put emails and other emails land at the bottom. She'd specifically written to Dr. Professor Reinhard that um, as a PS, like old fashioned emails, I'm very keen taken by Paul Farmer's writings and wonder if we could help to inspire the upcoming generation of students to think a bit like he did. It's quite poignant that comment for me because tomorrow is the anniversary of the second anniversary of the passing of Paul Farmer who died at 64 uh, just two years ago. He was a significant public health leader and an advocate of right-based approaches and I think it's highly appropriate that perhaps we should remain in today and the seeds and saplings is laid could perhaps help advance this agenda further. And, and, and I, I just thought I, we should remember him since it's, it, it, it's just prior to his, his thing, his anniversary. But I, I really think that I hope this such seminars will not only help to inspire upcoming generations of students, but also our current leaders and public health leaders and so on to think about such issues and act on issues. When Paul Farmer was awarded the, the very distinguished Philosophy and Culture Prize in 2020, the chair of the jury, Professor Kwana at Anthony Appar noted that he had reshaped our understanding of just, not just what it means to be sick or healthy, but also what it means to treat health as a human right and the ethical and political obligations that follow. Professor Farmer's work to advance a global health regime was driven by his profound belief that the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong with the world. Since this is the first in the series, I just thought I'd counterbalance his views by the famous Persian poet, at Saadi Shirazi, 
who comes from a different part of the world, from Paul Farmer. And there's a carpet of this quote on, 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 on in, in New York at the moment and, uh, around human rights. And he notes human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one, rem if one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you have no sympathy for human pain, this, the name of human you cannot retain. So welcome to this webinar series, colleagues and friends. It's my now pleasure to invite Professor Kevin Fenton, our faculty president, to actually formally open up the, the, this webinar series. Uh, over to you, Pro Professor Kevin. Thank you. Hello, colleagues, and welcome to the first of a new collaborative webinar series exploring a human rights-based approach to public health. I'm Professor Kevin Fenton, the president of the Faculty of Public Health. And although I unfortunately cannot attend today's meeting live, I felt it was important to record a short message thanking all of you here today and our international partners for collaborating with the faculty on this most important work. Now, climate change is a public health emergency and is the single biggest threat to global health, peace and security. It is a crisis multiplier and a significant driver of global and local health inequalities. We must pull every lever available to us as a global community of public health professionals to mitigate and adapt to the health impacts of climate change and environmental degradation. We must speak on behalf of both current and future generations, knowing that this will be one of the greatest public health challenges we face in our careers. We must recognize the scale of climate injustice and our responsibilities to vulnerable communities who suffer the greatest impacts of climate change. And we must act upon and enforce the protection of human rights, the right to health, indigenous rights, and intergenerational equity. Human rights-based approaches are essential for good public health policies and practice, including action to address climate change. This webinar is the first in a series offered by the Faculty of Public Health alongside the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Global Network for Academic Public Health, the Grunian Center for Health and Law, and the European Public Health Association to build understanding, competency, and capacity on human rights-based approaches for good public health policy and practice. I hope that many of you here today will join us in future webinars in this series as we continue to work together as an international public health community committed to driving forward a rights-based approach to health. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy today's event. It's now my pleasure to, to, um, to, to welcome uh, my co-host for these sessions. My name is Farhang Tazib. Um, I'm, I'm a public health physician. Uh, with a particular interest in public health ethics, law, and, and, and human rights. Um, normal Zoom uh, courtesies apply. Please put your comments in the chat and in QA uh, as we go along. Um, I, I, it's my pleasure now to, 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 to welcome my co-host from the Office for um, Commission for Human Rights, uh, Lynn Gentile, to say some opening words, please. Lynn, over to you. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to to be here. This is uh, this is an audience I'm I'm very fond of. Uh, the audience of people learning and um, who haven't yet become jaded and who are still really really passionate about um, the change that is possible in the world. So I I have a particular affinity for for students. So I'm really happy uh, to be here. Um, I'm just here to, to uh, just to introduce myself. Farang's already given us a really good introduction of what we're after. And I just want to pick up um, on one thing. Um, our experts are going to speak on the specific theme of climate change, uh, public health and the right to health. But I just wanted to share with you some reflections on the importance of human rights for public health. Um, as you know, the right to health is uh, is recognized in many human rights instruments, um, most of which we know. So we know about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, etc. So um, when we talk about the right to health, we talk about it as a right um, that is a, uh, a composite uh, right. So it's a right which uh, entitles people to health goods, facilities and services. But not only that, it's also a right which calls for attention to the underlying determinants of health. Um, and when we talk about that, we mean the social, economic, environmental and other conditions into which people are born and in which they live and grow and ultimately uh, die. So these determinants are the conditions which influence our ability to live well, uh, to live healthy lives. And they're really, really uh, important. They can include uh, things like poverty, access to education, uh, inequality, and discrimination. So because of the health consequences, uh, climate change and related phenomena have become really important as determinants of health. Um, I think we're, we're going to hear a lot more detail about uh, the interplay uh, of that. Um, but we know, for instance, that climate change is responsible for a range of health effects, uh, including um, changes in the prevalence and geographical distribution of food and waterborne pathogens, um, the rise and the prevalence of uh, mental health uh, conditions. So um, a human rights-based approach to addressing these issues requires attention in a number of areas, including uh, looking at what determinants are important. Um, and we will probably hear quite a bit on accountability, um, participation, and the adequate resourcing uh, for the protection of all the human rights which become vulnerable when, once we discuss uh, climate change. Um, so I will um, leave you uh, with just those, those few words. I may jump in here and there, but uh, you're in very, very, very good hands uh, indeed. Um, and I look forward to to our discussion as we as we get into it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Lynn, and and the collaboration of the Office for Human Rights in Geneva around this one. It's my pleasure now to 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 uh, to to introduce our, our keynote speaker, Professor Alia Eli Yamin, uh, who many of you will know uh, is a significant leader. Uh, scholar and advocate uh, around uh, right-based approaches to health and human rights. She teaches at Harvard, is a senior fellow at the Petri Fund Center for Health Law, um, also teaches at the School of Public Health in Harvard, and has taught at many, many universities and institutions uh, uh, around the world. Uh, significantly, in, in light of our previous comments, she's also a senior advisor at Partners for Health, uh, which is actually founded by, by Fall Pharma. Uh, in her career, she's combined fieldwork, research, advocacy, and scholarship in relation to human rights-based approaches. A rare combination, not only uh, doing scholarship, but also using her scholarship to make change and advocacy. She's founded many, many uh, programs and initiatives all around the world, in in 2016, uh, the U UN Secretary General appointed her as one of the 10 international experts to the Independent Accountability Panel uh, for this global strategy on women, children, and adolescent health and the sustainable development goals. And she has actually served on numerous WHO university advisory groups, committees, and has won many, many accolades uh, for her work. So, so we're really privileged to have her for work. Uh, Introducing her, I, I, I've been really struck by her, her book, her recent book, When Misfortune Becomes Injustice, Evolving Human Rights Struggles for Health and Human Social Justice. Uh, I haven't been paid actually to advertise her particular book, but I think it's quite pertinent uh, and relevant for our proposed discussions on climate change and right-based approaches to health. In the, in the Lancet review about this book, it noted that this book is not only about stories of struggle and suffering or the lack of opportunity that some may have to achieve good health because of inadequate social determinants or lofty aspirations of human rights. But Professor, uh, Professor Yamin argues that it's also about the urgent need to carry forward a transformative praxis of human rights in global health based on our common destiny and shared humanity. 
She actually finishes her book. This ends with a quote from Albert Camus. Our task as human beings is to make justice imaginable again in a world so obviously unjust. So it's a great privilege for me to introduce Professor El Yamin uh, for, to give her keynote uh, introduction to this webinar. Over to you, Professor Yamin. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much, Farhan, for that very, very generous introduction. Um, and thank you to all of the organizers for inviting me to participate in this uh, really amazing and opportune event today. I'm also uh, deeply touched by your reference to my colleague and beloved long-term friend, Paul Farmer. I, I think some of my remarks will echo it, Paul's views. We had collaborated closely and I, as you noted, still work at Partners in Health. Um, and uh, let me share my screen now and I'll... Uh, uh, can everybody see that? I hope. Um, so uh, uh, my remarks now are going to, one, one of the last things that I believe Paul wrote was something that he and I wrote together about human rights during the pandemic and sort of pointing out that it's very easy to name and shame and denounce violations, but getting at the structural drivers that perpetuate systematic inequalities within and between countries is a very different task. And so I'm going to uh, draw on the book that Farhang generously just mentioned, which is really a stock taking of work that I've done over decades to develop rights-based approaches to help. Um, and I think it's quite relevant to now rights-based approaches to climate change and if I offer some cautions, they're offered in the spirit of let's do things, let's learn from what did not work so well in health and do things differently here. So the book argues that when we set out to work on health, and there are a lot of parallels between health rights and climate related rights, we had to demonstrate the enforceability of rights related to health and now related to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. And there, I think that the climate that we have largely um, done that in health, the question is how to make sure that the uh, ways in which rights are enforced actually produce more equitable systems in, in the environmental space, I think that you're quite far ahead and have built on a lot of the work we've done in health. Um, the second challenge was articulating what it means to take human rights seriously in laws and policies related to health and now to environment, not just, but also in institutional practices and in our case, largely within health systems. I think that is infinitely more complicated in the climate space, which I'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. And then the third challenge was showing that taking a so-called rights-based approach would make a meaningful difference toward health and social justice, and in this case, toward climate justice. And there is where I think uh, I can share some lessons about what has not worked and where we have fallen short. Um, so, uh, right. So what? So so uh, I want to say this up front. Um, because I think Marit is going to talk about strategic litigation. I've done a lot of strategic litigation and analysis of judicial enforcement of health rights. Um, and I think that had we uh, unpacked more of our assumptions before, before the enthusiasm took us away on strategic litigation, we would have been more successful in structuring our cases and in, in framing the adjudication and in following up. Whenever you do strategic litigation, there are assumptions baked in about how different legal institutions will respond, about political bodies and actors' responses. 
and about the behavior of all actors responsible for enforcement and implementation and what kinds of impacts you can expect. I'm not going to go into detail right now, but I'm happy to talk about this further in the Q&A. So I think there have been significant normative advances on delineating the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment already, right? Uh, the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is embedded in some of the more recent transformative constitutions. It is also constructed through a variety of rights, including health, often including through consumer protection, uh, and sometimes the right to life, uh, but it is constructed as a constitutional right in many countries around the world. There has been in recent years an absolute flood of standard setting by international bodies from treaty monitoring bodies like the Committee on Economic and Social Rights to the Committee on the Rights of the Child to declarations from the Human Rights Council and most recently from the UN General Assembly on this right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Now, I should note that that's not always the way it is framed. Sometimes it is framed as the rights of nature. And I think that is something that is going to have to be worked out with climate change advocates. What is the right that we're talking about and how do we measure it, measure compliance with it? Uh, environmental rights have been top of mind for, they're already, the, the International Criminal Court is having a public consultation for Environmental Crimes Initiative, Ecocide. Uh, the Maastricht processes, both on extraterritorial obligations and of the rights of future generations, both of which I've been involved with, uh, really I believe were spurred or fostered by concern about climate change and climate catastrophe, extraterritorial obligations for those of you who are not uh, international lawyers, I mean obligations that are owed uh, by states often in the economic north because of transboundary impacts of their activities, their direct activities or the effects of say multinational corporations elsewhere across borders. And the rights of future generations were to break through a, um, a limitation in human rights about not thinking about sustainability and what that meant. So what does it mean to preserve all of the rights and choices for future generations so that they can, can make the same kinds of choices that we have in the world today? Uh, there has been, as you know, litigation at national, subnational, and supranational levels, even in the United States, which is not a place where we've seen right to health litigation. We've seen important climate change litigation in the state of Montana and uh, actually a case at national level too now. And these have all, or not all, but largely made explicit connections to health and human health. There's also, I think, which is uh, uh, more advanced than what we had in health, a recognition of the need for youth-led, global South-led movements. And that, I think, is extraordinarily important and positive for transformative change. So uh, I also think that we have ideas from the health space about how courts in this arena can preserve democratic legitimacy. This is a case from 2008 in Argentina about the cleanup of a very, very contaminated river basin um, where the court said, you know, because environmental rights, climate change involve what Lon Fuller described as spider web like implications. And one of the great barriers in enforcing health rights was this idea that courts are ill-suited to do that, that that should be left to the political branches of government. But over time in health, we have developed ways of having courts issue structural judgments. So in this case, in the case of the cleanup of a very, very contaminated river basin, 
the court worked collaboratively with civil society groups to mandate different levels of government addressing past and future harm, cleaning up the river basin, building drainage and sanitation, and adopting an emergency plan. But the cleanup was not dictated by the court itself. It said the, the, the public hearings with participation, institutional follow-up, the executive branch is responsible for doing this. We will say whether it passes constitutional muster. And I think that offers a very key lesson for litigation going forward. It's also of note that uh, expert knowledge, scientific knowledge uh, was extremely important in this case. This is a photo of the toxic sands being removed from the river basin. Um, there have been a tremendous number of efforts. I was pleased to see the announcement of the upcoming dialogue between Volk and uh, Tedros, uh, but there have already been quite a few connections between climate and health. Starting in 2010, countries were urged to formulate national adaptation plans inclusive of health considerations. In the Paris Agreement, there was recognized the importance of human rights, including the right to health. In 2021, WHO formalized the Alliance for Transformative Action on Climate and Health, aiming to construct climate resilient and sustainable health systems. There is a question whether the connection is just about adaptation, I should add, or whether the you need to think more broadly about the connections between climate and health. In 2022, the health pillar was of the uh, adaptation agenda was launched. And just this past year, discussions included climate resilient health systems and health adaptation. None of these really address uh, human rights based approaches to health, except there was also uh, uh, a project that took three years, it began at the beginning of the pandemic, which I was also involved in, to develop consensus principles under the International Commission of Jurists that has done this repeatedly before on different issues, say the Syracuse principles on declaring national security emergencies, Yogi Akarta principles uh, on the rights of LGBTQ plus uh, populations. So we developed consensus principles on human rights in public health emergencies. And I mention this specifically because unlike the international health regulations, for example, which are now currently being revised, they do not limit public health emergencies to those caused by disease outbreaks. They specifically include public health emergencies caused by things like climate events. So that may be a document that people want to look at. Um, the role of scientific research was a struggle at the time that we started with the right to health. It wasn't common for courts to use uh, expert testimony, for example. That is part of, that has really opened up in transformative constitutionalism. And the idea of, of having experts do amicus briefs, that also was not all that common in many courts around the world. Um, so, but now it is, and providing evidence in the context of specific events is absolutely critical. Public health professionals, it's not just public health evidence, but public health and clinical expertise play a huge role in specific disputes on you know a dam collapses in brazil what is the health related quality of life loss what are the effects of asthma from air pollution effects on reproductive outcomes psychosocial stress and trauma how do we measure those things that we need public health evidence and other scientific evidence we also need evidence not just in the context of disputes but on policy implementation with focuses on marginalized or disadvantaged populations and research to set standards, to set standards at national, regional and international levels. And by this, you know, I'll cite one example that I think is a positive example, the Model Forest Act initiative, 
which is a global partnership, intersectional partnership to improve legal protections of native forests. As you may know, deforestation is probably the biggest uh, uh, contributor or a risk for zoonotic transmission. Um, so the chair of this commission is actually a Brazilian jurist worried about the Amazon, but it's really um, creating, instead of doing a treaty, creating a model forest act to be replicated elsewhere and filling in the implementation gap and improving scientific soundness is absolutely a critical aspect of this initiative, as it will be in all initiatives relating to climate justice, in my view. Okay, so let's move on to some of the challenges that I see. And here I'm gonna go back in history to 2003, which is when the human rights-based approach to development, the common, the UN common understanding of a human rights-based approach to development was issued. Now let's remember the context. That was during the Millennium Development Goals, which had an extremely technocratic, top-down, vertical and narrow approach to measuring progress in the world. So the human rights-based approach was a reaction to that. We'd had these massive transsectoral conferences in the 90s that saw progress as based on institutional and political change. Then that changed very much to a top-down framework with nested goals, targets and indicators that had enormous implications for global governance, for um, uh, the, the measurement of progress, et cetera, for, for how we conceive of our knowledge, our epistemic frameworks of knowledge about progress. So the HRBA was conceived as a reaction to that. It's based on universality and indivisibility equality and non-discrimination, participation, accountability, as uh, Lynn Gentile outlined in her opening remarks. They seek to contribute to the development of the capacities of duty bearers to meet their obligations and or of rights holders to claim their rights. Uh, and the human rights-based approach seeks to analyze inequalities which lie at the heart of development problems and redress discriminatory practices and unjust distributions of power that impede development progress and often result in groups of people being left behind. Now, again, this was launched during the Millennium Development Goals, which completely erased inequalities within countries and was focused on the global South. It was not a universal agenda, not interdependent and indivisible, didn't look at inequalities, was really about reducing extreme poverty. So a very, very limited agenda and human rights-based approaches were in reaction to this. Now, the sustainable development goals that we are currently in is better than the millennium development goals. They have a whole, the HRBA is one of the key guiding principles. There are a whole lot of goals related to climate action. Um, arguably, all of the goals are in some way related to climate action, but the sustainable development goals still have some of the structural failings of the millennium development goals that we are operating in. So I think we should be cautious about saying, for example, in health, that the goal uh, three on universal health coverage is the materialization of the right to health. In my view, it is not. Uh, the materialization of the right to health, it can be made to be consistent with the progressive achievement of the right to health. So a couple, uh, let's unpack some of these um, uh, elements of human rights-based approaches. I think most people would agree that there are issues related to asymmetries and exposure to climate-related hazards, and there are issues related to inequalities or disparities in material social infrastructures needed to withstand the events of such, event, such events, which is why there is a big focus on adaptation and health, right? So under human rights law, there are 
uh, largely two kinds of equality or inequality, treating everybody who is similarly situated equally, that is formal equality, which requires neutral legislation. And then there is something called substantive equality, which requires differentiated or positive measures for certain populations. So you might think of uh, greater attention for um, women with reproductive health needs, for example, either in health systems generally or because of the effects on reproductive outcomes of climate related heat. Um, right. So and and for those of you who are in public health and unfamiliar with human rights law, I often uh, look at these and people in public health tend to think of equality only as being formal equality, which is largely this, that everybody gets the same thing, and like to talk about equity, which is uh, reflected in this picture. I actually think that neither of these forms of equality are going to be enough, right? We're going to need structural equality because the things that drive asymmetries in exposure to climate related hazards and even the inability to provide material infrastructure to respond are driven systematically by the facets of our institutions and our global institutional order, our global political economy. So if I were to reframe this, there would be a third um, picture, which is more about structural equality or justice, which doesn't have the fence in front of these people, because I think that is the big issue that we are going to face. So here's an, an example. So in that uh, case in Argentina, where we're clearing up the, the river basin, people were moved, they were relocated. But that of course increased inequalities because some people were relocated to much better places. Some people who didn't meet certain amorphous criteria were not relocated and left to stay in these uh, slums, is visas miserias, as they say in Argentina. So there is a real question when you're thinking through strategic litigation or in general on policies that sometimes poverty and, and the exposures to what is going on in a climate event or a broader climate change can be mitigated while actually inequalities can grow more profound. The second example I want to give is, you know, in the United States, we have the Inflation Reduction Act, where big, big incentives to move to uh, electric vehicles, for example. Um, now, electric vehicles rely on lithium batteries. And uh, lithium batteries are often found in areas that are uh, inhabited by indigenous populations, pueblos originarios in Latin America, as they're called. Um, and now this drive for lithium, the 21st century gold, is creating a lot of violence and a lot of persecution of indigenous communities. This is the Mapuches in Argentina, but the same could be said in Peru. In Chile, I think we're going to see the same thing in, in other countries around the region, in Bolivia. So we have to be cautious about what inequalities are created by issues that we believe are advancing progress. Second uh, question that is sort of the sine qua non of a human rights-based approach, as I read you, capacities of duty bearers, uh, willingness of claims holders to claim their rights. What are we holding people accountable for? And who are we holding accountable, right? Because it's not just accountability for outcomes, for reducing, say, carbon emissions, uh, or for um, uh, uh, whatever can be measured through abstracted quantitative indicators. It's also in a human rights-based approach, accountability for effort, 
how much budgetary resources are being put toward this, what are the policies that are in place, how are those policies constructed and created, um, accountability for process, are marginalized communities, are the people whose lives are going to be affected included? And that's not simple. It wasn't simple, it isn't simple in health. And I think it's far more complicated in climate to have representativeness that doesn't squelch other intra-group differences. The question of who we are holding accountable is equally important, right? Human rights has uh, this notion of uh, economic and social rights, including health, being progressively realized to the maximum extent of available resources, but with international assistance and cooperation, right? Those are included in the maximum extent of available resources. In my view, international assistance and cooperation in health is deeply problematic but it's even more so in climate, right? The idea that Northern countries can aid wash the loss and damage and pillaging and ravaging of the environments in the global South for centuries with international assistance and cooperation is deeply, deeply problematic. So what do we do? Do we look at common but differentiated responsibilities? Absolutely, but there is a big pushback right now against common but differentiated responsibilities. If you follow the executive board meetings of the World Health Organization, I also think we need to look at extraterritorial obligations uh, of the global north, including for reparative justice, right? Not just for adaptation, but obviously for mitigation of climate related. Um, uh, sources of, of ill health, but also of loss and damage for all that they have done in the past. One of the things that we tend to accept is, oh, that's going to be too hard. That's going to, and that is a historical amnesia, which the article I referred to at the beginning that I wrote with Paul Farmer really lambasts that tendency to say, oh, it's going to be too hard. We can't do that. Uh, let's just move on. So in the case in Argentina, it has proven basically impossible to hold the, um, the chemical companies and the waste management companies that left all this toxic sand out to account. It's been easier to hold to some extent different levels of government to account. And I think that is also a word of caution or to be better than we have been in the past in climate change litigation and lobbying. So accountability in health, and this is something that I think will come up again in climate change, although in a different way, we have done a lot of work on not making it just about punishing individual people in the frontline health workers and about looking at the health system as a core social institution where people who are users of health services are not consumers with preferences, but they are citizens, social citizens exercising their entitlements of citizenship and democratizing health systems that are extremely uh, technocratic and can be extremely autocratic. So looking at the way the policy cycles in health systems, the, the relationship of claims, not just of patients to frontline providers, but of frontline providers to the program designers, of the program designers to the policymakers and the politicians, of the policymakers, the ministries of health to elected government to give budgets out and on and on. That I think is going to be um, a formidable task in the climate space, because it's not just one system. It's not just one system in health either. It's all of the social determinants that Lynn Gentile rightly observed, but it's going to be more complicated and yet I think a necessary uh, piece of work. Participation. You know, again, part meaningful participation is absolutely the crux of a human rights-based approach. 
the idea that in a democracy, people have a right to have policies that affect their lives justified to them. And we have worked a lot on what that means, but there's not universal agreement. Is Should participation be legislated in a forum? Should it be um, demanded through the politics of the street and, and controlled by the activists? What is the relationship between local participation and national and supranational participation? There have been some excellent examples of motion in this way. In this case, in Argentina, there was a large component of participation in public hearings. It worked okay, I would say, in terms of getting participation of the actual communities who were affected. Participation tends to go toward the more elite groups in society that are more comfortable with speaking in courts or speaking in legislatures. And that is exponentially, that, that kind of bias is exponentially exacerbated when we talk about the global level and who gets to voice their perspective and participate, right? Um, and all of these factors then determine how you measure the evidence of impact, how you're defining the human rights-based approach along all these elements. What is evidence? Again, it's not just going to be outcomes. Using a human rights-based approach changes the evaluative space. There are material consequences, which are direct in terms of specific policies that may uh, lower carbon emissions or create more funding for a health system, et cetera. But there are lots of indirect effects of human rights-based approaches of forming coalitions of activists, symbolic approach of, of transforming public opinion about the problems, urgency, and gravity, which are even more important but very difficult to document. And funders and donors want documentation. This is another version of human rights-based approaches that suggests that there are individual levels, structural levels, programmatic levels, and societal levels. And of course, in climate change, global levels, right? So those are all, I think, issues that we will face. This is the final uh, thing, which, you know, I think in health, we have not succeeded in creating a more just egalitarian world. And that's because we did not focus on the political economy that was changing and evolving as we were building this normative scaffolding, right? During the pandemic, the colonialist foundations of global governance for health as well as in general were revealed, right? And we now see that the multilateral order that was constructed after World War II is not fit for dealing with global pandemics. And there may be some, there are in fact ongoing efforts to shift institutions, but also just to maintain peace and security, right? There are serious failures of not just the United Nations, but the IMF and the World Bank in terms of issuing uh, special drawing rights and uh, uh, forgiving debt, for example, not imposing renewed austerity after the pandemic. Those are significant structural failures. We saw gross inequalities during the pandemic exacerbated within and between countries with billionaires being minted every every minute while billions of people were thrust into poverty and an enormous concentration of private wealth. Here is the over years, the discrepancy between public wealth, which is what we need to create climate adaptation or actually mitigation or funds for loss and damage versus private wealth which redounds to the benefit of these ultra wealthy individuals. And it creates a terrible, unvirtuous cycle of deforming political agendas and inuring to the benefit of the very wealthy even more. Um, we saw during the pandemic, the importance of political culture and infrastructures for delivering rights 
even as we saw a slide toward illiberalism, which will make it difficult to maintain that political culture. And we saw uh, philanthropic capitalism and private sector solutions as part of the problem in the pandemic. And I think they are part of the problem in addressing climate change. So in climate change, you know, for example, uh, if we just focus on climate, we will miss the fact that yes, Pakistan was underwater with floods, uh, you know, but Pakistan is also underwater in debt distress, right? So we cannot eliminate from our view the political economy questions. Some of the most progressive jurisprudence on climate, say in Colombia, where they recognize the rights of nature of an ecosystem, also happened in a country where the constitutional court just allowed um, uh, royalties from uh, mineral and uh, oil exploration to be deducted. So big fossil fuel subsidies. So without looking at the overall structural context, I think we will again miss some of the things that in health we have missed over these years. So to conclude, how do we combat these, uh, how do we build on our strengths and combat some of the dangers? Networked research and advocacy across borders and disciplines and fields, right? We have to be able to see what is happening to the indigenous communities in Latin America while we were doing advocacy in this country. We have to be able to see what is happening in health systems that are being increasingly privatized and financialized and what we can expect from climate adaptation. We just, we cannot have the luxury of working on health equity separate from climate justice anymore. Litigation, in my view, needs to be embedded in social and political organizing. Litigation by itself is not going to get us what we want or need. And that's a message that is sometimes lost in our exuberance for creating new standards or having a really compelling case. Overall, we need to focus on the political economy, on debt justice on tax justice. Tax is, as people in Oxfam like to say, our superpower. It combats that unvirtuous cycle of economic wealth going to the ultra wealthy, and it provides resources to do all of the things we want to do. Global and regional public investment, I think, is absolutely critical. We now, the way climate finance is happening now, it's mostly through non-concessional loans. There are not a lot of grants and not even a lot of concessional loans in terms of climate finance, and that cannot be. Um, and uh, so we need public long-term investment in this issue, which is uh, democratize so that the people from states where they're bearing the biggest burden have a voice in how the money is used and they're not the same kinds of vertical funds that we've seen before. Uh, the pandemic fund, for example, is despite advocacy around it, not looking very good. And that's really a shame because that also has to do with climate adaptation. And ultimately, we need narrative change. We need that ideational and discursive change. And I hear I've put it might seem trivial, the Lorax, but I remember reading that as a child. And the other side has a lot of clout and advantages. We need and also works at uh, with children as they're forming their consciousness. And we need to do the same. It's not just legal change. It's really consciousness change. Um, and I think we have all of the um, advantages of understanding as Farhang began with that, the moral understanding that we are all part of a common humanity. So I'll stop there and I hope there ha has provoked some questions, maybe disagreement, and I look forward to the Q&A. 
Thank you very much indeed, uh, Alicia, for your very powerful, highly pertinent uh, uh, keynote on this one. You raised many, many, many issues, and in the chat, uh, it, it generates quite a lot of this, the discussion. I know there's some also some comments in the chat around what does CBRD and ETO stand for, and wonderful colleagues are actually responding this, and it's good to collaborate, uh, multidisciplinary uh, understanding around these issues, uh, and, and, and around this, show. thank you very much indeed, Alessia, on behalf of all the participants, a very grateful uh, to you and, and look forward to discussing some of the issues during the uh, panel discussion and so on. Uh, it's my privilege now to um, invite Benjamin Schachter from the Office for um, High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva uh, to, to, to share some reflections from his perspective. He is, um, he, he is a trained lawyer. He worked as an attorney in the US. He has also worked on research with United Nations Special Rapporteur. He's actually the focal point for climate change as Office for Human rights uh, in Geneva. He he he's led all the various uh, um, panels and so on at the various UNFCCs, and he's very much been leading the work around this issue. So uh, and he's been extremely helpful uh, around various agenda. Uh, so it's a great privilege now to ask Benjamin uh, to 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 now respond. Please, thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Farhang and to Professor Yamin for, for that uh, opening keynote remarks, um, which, which I think uh, laid the groundwork very well for our discussion. Um, as Farhang said, um, I coordinate the work of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Um, I've been doing that since 2015, uh, based in Geneva, so we engage quite extensively, of course, with the Human Rights Council, and we support the work of the Human Rights Council. Um, but we also have been uh, participating in and engaged in the work of the UNFCCC since the negotiations of the Paris Agreement. And, and I've had the privilege, um, one might say, <laughs> to attend uh, every um, major climate negotiations since Paris um, on behalf of, of OHCHR. Um, and I, I think where I'll start here is is just by sharing a few of the the places where the UNFCCC and the Human Rights Council's work overlap um, with respect to uh, human right to health and climate change. Um, and, and then I'll move into um, articulating a little bit more from the perspective of OHCHR, uh, the relationships between climate change and health and the corresponding obligations of states and businesses uh, with respect to uh, climate change because of that. So the first thing I want to say is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, talks very clearly about human health and welfare and preventing the adverse effects of climate change on human health and welfare as its purpose, right? And, and so they didn't use the word human rights uh, in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, but that reference to human health and welfare uh, is, is a great hook. Um, dating all the way back to, to the Framework Convention uh, for potential engagement. Um, in the Paris Agreement, in its preamble, it calls upon all states to respect, promote, and consider their respective human rights obligations when taking climate action. And it includes an enumerated list of specific human rights, including the right to health. Um, it also refers to, and Professor Amin uh, addressed um, issues related to non-discrimination and equality, it refers to in, 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 uh, gender equality and women's empowerment. It refers to the rights of indigenous peoples, the rights of persons with disabilities, the rights of children. Um, so, so it actually explicitly uh, addresses um, these issues in the Paris Agreement, make, making a very clear statement that you know, climate change is a right to health issue and it is a human rights issue. Um, we had... Uh, and have had a number of Human Rights Council resolutions on climate change. Uh, one in 2015 explicitly was on climate change and its impacts on the right to health. Uh, and I'll share uh, information related to the work that that asked the office to do. 
Uh, and, you know, just flagging now that, you know, this was actually the first thematic issue uh, that the Human Rights Council asked us to explore specifically with respect to um, climate change, climate change and its impacts on the right to health. And I, I think that's um, also quite significant. Um, so the office produced a report and organized a panel discussion on that subject in 2016. Um, Professor Yamin talked about the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Uh, the right is recognized in some way, shape, or form in 160 plus national jurisdictions. There's a Human Rights Council resolution, 48 slash 13, recognizing the right to a healthy environment, which was adopted in 2021. There is also a GA resolution, uh, 76 slash 300, recognizing the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, uh, also adopted in 2021. Now, these, sorry, 2022, I forget the dates. Um, <laughs> recent, but um, they've been around long enough that they are now reflected in in cup decisions so the cup 27 outcome and that helps helps me with the dates uh is the first cup outcome to explicitly refer to the right to clean healthy and sustainable environment uh the cup 28 outcome which was adopted at the end of last year in dubai also explicitly refers to the right to a clean healthy and sustainable environment um so we we can see from from the work that's ongoing and since that climate change resolution on health, there have been, uh, you know, there's been a resolution every year. It's asked us to look at a variety of subjects, many of which relate to equality and non-discrimination and other determinants of health. So um, looking at climate change's impacts on the rights of persons with disabilities, climate change and its impacts on the rights of children, climate change and uh, women's rights and gender equality, climate change and food security, it's, I think, very critical to note that these issues are both um, sort of determinants of health, environmental determinants of health, but also uh, many of them human rights in and of themselves, right? So gender equality, the right to food, the right to healthy environment, so on and so forth. So those are the connections. What does all this mean in terms of uh, human rights-based approach and the human rights obligations of states? And, and what is the added value? of uh, rights-based approach to climate action uh, with a particular focus on, on the right to health. Um, in, in simple uh, terms, and I'll, I'll try to be brief, uh, you know, I, I, I think that we, we talk about a few different things. Um, and, and these include the fact that, okay, Climate change impacts people's health in a ton of different ways. Uh, one example, um, which I think is, is very uh, glaring, 7 million people a year are killed by air pollution, right? And air pollution, much of that air pollution in particulate matter is worsened by climate change and also comes from uh, the combustion of fossil fuels, which contributes to climate change. Um, so addressing air pollution, um, should be a matter of, and is a matter of human rights obligations, right? We, we know there's an impact, we know it affects people's rights. All states have an obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill rights. Therefore, they have an obligation, this is not something that's voluntary, to actually take action to address climate change, to address air pollution, so on and so forth. Second point, uh, a rights-based approach is something that leads to more effective and sustainable outcomes. Um, this is something that is included in the findings of the IPCC and its sixth assessment report. Um, and, and it comes out very clearly that, you know, not only are we talking about a matter of human rights obligation, we're talking about something that results in better policy uh, outcomes for people and the planet. Uh, third point, we, we already covered, participatory and inclusive. This is part of the rights-based approach. This is critical to leaving no one behind, uh, to um, kind of looking at the interlinkages between the 2030 Agenda for Sustainability and, and Human Rights. Another uh, important piece is 
that the human rights-based approach addresses not just the obligations of states, but also the responsibilities of businesses. And um, all too often, this area is not being addressed, right? And the, the reality is that the vast majority of greenhouse gas emissions uh, come from the action of businesses, and that we also have uh, a real problem in terms of access to information, which is a human right, uh, the right to benefit from science and its applications, precisely because of the actions of businesses um, in terms of perpetuating uh, misinformation, um, greenwashing, and contributing to the climate crisis. So we're dealing with both the obligations of states and the responsibilities of businesses. Um, uh, another point in, in here, you know, very health specific is that we're, t we're talking, when we're talking about the right to health, we're talking about to the highest sustainable, attainable standard of physical and mental health. And I, I think the mental health component of uh, climate change is often overlooked. Um, there are implications. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, research and, and, and new studies about climate anxiety. There's also implications related to the exclusion of people from decision-making processes, which is a violation of their rights, but, but, uh, but has impacts on their mental health that, that are important to consider. Um, Professor Yumin talked about cooperation, equity, solidarity, common but differentiated responsibility. Um, these are human rights principles. Um, and cooperation is an obligation. All states have an obligation to cooperate internationally to prevent human rights harms. Um, and, and that means that actually when we talk about climate finance, uh, when we talk about economic justice and debt justice, we like to talk about that from a human rights perspective. The office is, is working extensively on, on the human rights economy because states have to mobilize maximum available resources for the progressive realization of economic, social, and cultural rights, including the right to health. Um, and, and they actually have an obligation to take these actions in terms of uh, changing the you know, socioeconomic systems in order to align them toward uh, respecting, protecting, and fulfilling human rights, um, as opposed to the, the current orientation, which, which seems largely directed towards uh, um, increasing profits for a select few people. Um, I think I mentioned already the right to benefit from science and its applications. That's an important point. There have been a number of questions raised about the rights of nature, um, and, and I've started responding to some of those in the chat, and and may continue to do so in, in that medium in the, the interest of time. But I do just want to flag that when we talk about a rights-based approach, cultural rights are an important part of that. And uh, the protection of cultural rights includes and requires the protection of, of different worldviews, religions, and perspectives. Um, and the rights of nature are an integral component of many people's uh, worldviews and perspectives. And in that sense, need to be uh, in, in some way reflected uh, within um, a human rights based approach. Uh, and, and it's a little bit complicated from there. I, I will share some, uh, some additional reflections and thoughts um, in writing. Um, and, and finally, just on you know, health and a healthy environment and one health approach, which actually kind of potentially can bring together uh, some of these these different elements, including rights of nature, um, I, I think that's a, a really um, interesting and an important approach that the WHO and the international community are working towards advancing. Um, and um, yeah, the last two, three things I want to say um, in, in terms of our key messages, mitigation is a matter of human rights obligation, right? We, we have to mitigate, we have to stop contributing to the climate crisis in order to protect people's rights, including their right to health and their right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Adaptation is also uh, a matter of obligation, and adaptation measures should be um, designed to benefit the people most affected by climate change, um, and, and, and people in vulnerable situations. 
And loss and damage is very much a UNF triple C terminology. Um, from a human rights perspective and when talking about a rights-based approach, we don't talk about loss and damage. We talk about access to justice and effective remedies. And under human rights law, people are entitled to access to justice and effective remedies for the harms that they experience um, as a result of climate change. And the reality is right now, uh, uh, Professor Yumi referenced climate litigation. Um, you know, there, there isn't an adequate mechanism for ensuring people access to remedy right now. Uh, litigation um, has been successful in some cases. Uh, the loss and damage fund uh, established by the UNFCCC, not yet operational, underfunded. Uh, there will be problems with access of rights holders to the funds. Um, and, and so we need to continue to work to elaborate better mechanisms to ensure that the people affected by climate change um, do have access to remedy for, for the harms that they experience. And, and that's a key priority of the office. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Benjamin. That, that, that's very useful. Um, I think we're having quite a feast today because he also covered very, very important areas uh, in, 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 in terms of commenting at uh, Professor Al Yamin's um, uh, keynote. Uh, I want to invite our, 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 our Dr. Dr. Maya Groff, who is an international lawyer based in the aid, who is a sit in developing and servicing multilateral treaties and has worked with various criminal tribunals. And he also uh, he, he's teaching regularly at the Hague at Academy of International Law and also other other centers. Um, she has extensive, but she's worked extensively around uh, global treaties and has done a lot of innovative work around uh, child law uh, and the Pioneer International Held Network of Judges uh, is a piece of innovative work uh, she, she has carried out. Uh, she's drafted international legal policies and international current international uh she's published a huge amount um she has an extensive quite an impressive she is actually a, a lawyer uh um and 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 associated with the bar in in new york and and on various groups and one of the most important things in terms of our discussion today is that she won the uh, 2018 new shape prize for global governance innovation and and therefore, as a result of that, she's now the convener of the Global Governance Commission for Climate Change, which is highly relevant, I think, to our discussion. Having an international uh, lawyer talking about uh, global governance and climate change, I think would be useful for our conversation. Uh, Professor Groff, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Farhang. And uh, thanks to you and colleagues for the invitation. I'm just going to share my screen and start my PowerPoint. So yes, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here with you today to share some perspectives from the Climate Governance Commission, uh, which has been working on uh, strategic focused improvements in our collective cooperative governance mechanisms at the international level. And as Farhang mentioned, I am an international lawyer, uh, primarily by uh, profession and, and practice. And so it's just been a delight to listen to the other speakers and uh, to get re-inspired about some of these intersections. Um, so the Climate Governance Commission, I'm, I'm starting with this photo to see, you know, the kind of human, the international human endeavor that it is. You see there Mary Robinson, who is serving as chair uh, of the Climate Governance Commission in its high level phase, where we have uh, ambassadors for the commission's work, including former heads of state and youth activists. We have Shi Bastida, who's there, who's uh, a Mexican American indigenous youth climate activist. You have Maria Fernanda Espinosa, who's one of the first uh, female presidents of the UN General Assembly, Johan Rockström, who's uh, a noted uh, international planetary scientist. So we're trying to really bring together uh, people from all diverse regions and have also an interdisciplinary background to try to make uh, proposals at this juncture in, in human history. And indeed, uh, I just want to emphasize, you know, you know what is this crossroads we're at as an international community? Alicia mentioned, you know, these challenges <laughs> and some of the challenges that, that lie ahead, some of the things we're going to have to grapple with, um, you know, not least, uh, you know, 
very technical uh, matters of, of loss and ja damage and remedies, access to justice. Um, but then, of course, you know, just basic uh, mitigation work at the international level, which we are not yet uh, doing sufficiently, of course. Um, so the Secretary General made this comment in 2021, when we are at an inflection point in history, our biggest shared test since the Second World War, a stark and urgent choice, break down or break through. So I think, I think this is indeed correct. And I think uh, Farhang, uh, all credit to you and colleagues for trying to facilitate this cross-disciplinary dialogue about how do we get to those breakthroughs uh, in the interests of the whole of the human family. And I would say even that uh, biggest shared test since Second World War, this, this perhaps is an even greater, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> test than the Second World War in, in that we have uh, no documented historic precedent uh, uh, based on the global uh, environmental ecological shifts that we have uh, already caused and uh, will continue to, to catalyze uh, if we do not take urgent action. So I think when we think about, you know, the intersections of public health, human rights, climate change, uh, we also have to look at the other planetary boundaries, which are interdependent with uh, the climate change, uh, climate related boundary related to biodiversity, loss, land system change, freshwater, et cetera. And these, of course, are all related to uh, the, the environmental conditions needed for humanity to flourish. So both, of course, individuals to flourish and, and, and to have access to health, uh, uh, but also uh, for communities and our civilizations as we know it and our societies. Uh, so I just want to underline you know, the crucial importance of looking at all of these planetary boundaries together. And this is why we've transitioned in the Climate Governance Commission to really talking about the planetary emergency, which uh, the Club of Rome, for example, has, has done pioneering work on and we're working with them. Uh, and scientists like Johan Rockström, you know, ha have said, we, we do not issue this sort of statement or this, this labeling of our current situation lightly. This is really based on uh, the, the accreted scientific analysis. So of course you see these planetary boundaries and we've already overstepped six of the nine. So in terms of ensuring the conditions for human health and flourishing, we have to come back to that green safe operating space. And we only have about six or seven years left now in our climate budget in terms of greenhouse gas emissions at current rates. Uh, so we're in quite a, a predicament, which is why the Climate Governance Commission has been working uh, so hard on sort of this macro uh, governance architectural uh, proposals, which we think will likely be necessary. And I just also wanted to show this slide. It's from our friends at Common Home of Humanity. And again, I think it's just interesting to kind of get our heads around what we're grappling with, what we have to govern now. We can't just look at nation states looking up. We have to understand these biophysical systems uh, around the earth of climate, other, other biophysical uh, processes that have kept us in the safe off operating space of the Holocene. Now, of course, we're in the Anthropocene. Uh, where we are such a fundamental uh, actor on, on the planet that we have transformed our very, our, our very life support system. So indeed, this task we have is very challenging, uh, formidable, and will require this interdisciplinary uh, dialogue, uh, working together at uh, very high levels, but all, uh, international levels, but at every level of governance. So this is just a few more of our commissioners. So you get a sense of, of the others who are contributing. I just want to you know, call out a few, just so you, you also get the global scope. Ma Jun, for example, he's, he's our Chinese uh, commissioner uh, working in Beijing. He's working, for example, on extremely important corporate and multinational accountability and transparency measures in, in China, extraordinary work. Sharon Burrow, who's uh, a noted uh, global labor uh, leader, 
a few more youth uh, activists uh, and for example, Chido Mapemba, who's the uh, uh, African Union youth uh, uh, envoy, uh, as well as Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, first female head of state of an African nation, et cetera. So this sort of also testifies to, you know, the, the leadership of, of such former states people and, and individuals who, who really want to step forward and help to also fill what we see as, as really a le leadership gap in addressing uh, the governance uh, deficit, addressing you know, the policy gap, why aren't we actually implementing the policies that we need to in time to confront the climate crisis given the gravity, given its comprehensive nature, given its unprecedented nature. So in a 2021 report of the Climate Governance Commission, an interim report, we identified three, three gaps. Quickly, I'll just mention solution action gap in the sense that we have the technical solution with current technology to address the climate crisis, but these simply are not being implemented in time at scale across geographies, uh, by business, uh, across economies. The policy gap, very important. Uh, that uh, policy-wise, very few countries have adequate or barely adequate policies to actually be compliant with the Paris Agreement, for example. And then again, the governance gap uh, that particularly the international level, I'm an international lawyer, so this interests me the most. We have the institutional legal uh, technology, so to speak, to improve our governance vastly, but we, we just have not yet uh, taken the bull by the horns and done that. And just referencing a few of our technical background reports, again, focusing on this policy governance gap, connecting, for example, national climate policy councils, which should be scientifically in, in, informed. They could involve health professionals to inform and guide national governments to connect uh, with their international obligations. Uh, we had uh, an excellent paper written on towards a global environment agency, which has been suggested by multiple scientists across uh, uh, the years. And indeed is, is sort of an example of, um, you know, how govern governments and the international community uh, as a whole is remiss in, in ensuring the basic architecture uh, in place to really grapple with the challenges, the ecological climate and other planetary boundaries challenges. So we just released a report in November 2023 uh, last year to hone with the help of our commissioners 10 near-term proposals for governance reform and five medium-term proposals. And I'll just give you a sample. So we heard about you know, the necessity of global public finance and tax, uh, which, which should be indeed, I completely agree, our superpower. And we have some suggestions. We're working with the Global Public Investment Initiative now. Uh, we have the global finance to provide for everybody, healthcare, uh, climate finance, et cetera. We're just not mobilizing those, those financial uh, sort of resources and putting in place the right mechanisms. I don't have time to get into <laughs> our various proposals. We can come back to them, but this is near term because we need to act across the international system, across different uh, dimensions, policy dimensions. And then here, the sort of medium term um, proposals for governance uh, enhancements, global environment agency, as I mentioned, international uh, legal uh, standing institutional bodies that are well designed to meet the needs of uh, our planetary emergency and a globalized world. And I'll just also mention number five, we, you see we have finance for the political economy dimension, which are absolutely imperative, but just number number five here, uh, because Farhan, you and colleagues in, in the blurb for this webinar, you talked about, you know, the secure, the peace and security dimensions and these, you know, the situation we're in now is also about uh, interwoven risks and, and global public goods. One of those global public goods is international rule of law. And we see, of course, these regressive sort of flare ups in, in you know, old geopolitical unresolved festering uh, circumstances. So the UN Charter, for example, has not been reformed uh, uh, since uh, uh, 1945, its adoption and its vision really was to ensure that we had the judicial international legal architecture to uh, prevent uh, war and conflict to ensure peaceful settlement of disputes. And I, and I think if we uh, upgrade our core international legal architecture, we also at the same time 
uh, with needed adjustments, uh, respond to the Anthropocene and grapple with our very grave environmental issues. So just to speedily conclude, <laughs> I want to introduce the uh, global civil society uh, platform that we are developing and it's available, there's a website, but I just wanted to mention this because there is a lot of um, anxiety and worry or these global governance measures that we will in fact very, very likely need to confront the climate and interrelated challenges. They seem to be very big and very difficult, but the technology of the sociological technology of the smart coalition has been tremendously successful, uh, creating the International Criminal Court, among other institutional changes with civil societies and like like minded uh, governments. So I think my time is out uh, up and I'll just end with this wonderful quote by, by Toby Ord, a philosopher I really like. Um, he talks about a future when we, we will have a more just, skillful, mature civilization. He talks about the current time as a precipice on which we are standing. But I think that we together can accelerate this just, skillful and, and mature civilization right now. <laughs> and I'm glad to hear uh, so many of the components here today uh, from the other speakers in terms of thinking of humanity uh, you know, together as, as one family, as the UN Secretary General uh, discusses, and and also really thinking about the background inequality issues, political economy issues, which have come up, by the way, again and again in, in our commission. I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Professor. I think, I, I think this is a very important part of the jigsaw, and we very much hope that in our future webinars, we, 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 perhaps concentrate on, on, on this aspect a little more. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, time is moving on and it's, it's great privilege now just uh, for, our, for our final um, presentation to, to ask Marlies Hesselman, who is Assistant Professor at uh, Transboundary Legal Studies at University of Groningen, uh, to, to share her insights. Uh, she's done a huge amount of work uh, around, particularly around climate change and her PhD was actually on human rights and access to modern energy systems and we very much look forward to hearing her, her reflections on the issue. Marlies, over to you, please. Thank you for, um, for that introduction. And let me open up my uh, PowerPoint. Apologies is brief, but, but just time is moving on. So, so uh, I, I thought uh, uh, people can read the, 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 the stuff on, off the internet, hopefully. No, that was an excellent introduction. Well, thank you so you. much. And, uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, here in this uh, webinar a little bit more about the work that we have been doing uh, also at the Groningen Center for Health Law uh, on climate change and human rights, and specifically also the role of litigation in this sphere. And it was already touched upon uh, a bit by previous speakers as well. And the aim is uh, to look a little bit closer at what litigation could mean recognizing uh, well that there are also some important limitations. Um, but what we have been hearing so far is that indeed uh, a human rights approach to climate change, or specifically a right to health uh, approach, uh, could maybe help improve climate action, speed up climate action. Uh, and we've also just heard that there are still important governance gaps uh, and that maybe action on climate change is not moving forward as speedily as is needed and as we would hope. Uh, in terms of being able to really curb dangerous levels of climate change, uh, whereby we may argue that actually in some respects, dangerous levels of climate change are already occurring because all around the world, people are already experiencing various impacts on their health as a result of climate change. So taking urgent action is uh, extremely important. And I think this is precisely what um, also drives people and organizations uh, to try to step to the court with the law in hand, uh, increasingly with their human rights in hand, to demand more ambitious action, faster action, uh, or to simply implement what is already there. Uh, because what you see here on your uh, on the slides uh, on your right hand side is the so called climate action tracker. Uh, it's a very uh, helpful tracker uh, that tries to put in place or give an overview of what states, especially countries, have uh, so far committed within the context of these conferences of parties of the UN Framework Convention, uh, what they have pledged, so what they plan to do, uh, what are the climate targets uh, for the future, but also what have they put behind that in terms of actual policies, uh, but then uh, in terms of uh, what they are actually already implementing, uh, that may be even lower. 
So there is this understanding that states pledge certain targets that are needed, then they need to pledge certain policy actions or legal actions, and then they actually need to implement them. And currently at all these three levels, there is still insufficient action. Uh, and this is what worries many people around the world, uh, and including environmental NGOs or health NGOs. Uh, and as I said, they are approaching increasingly courts to say that the lack of action, both in terms of targets and of policy implementation, uh, is a violation of their human rights. Um, I think that is then also a major uh, um, objective at the moment of climate litigation, is to make sure that the mitigation of greenhouse gases go, goes faster. And then I have two examples of that, of successful cases in, in a minute. Uh, but also we see climate litigation being aimed at very specific uh, harmful activities, and especially also uh, new fossil fuel activities where people are stepping to court, trying to challenge, again, also with human rights in hand, uh, for example, a new license for oil or coal or gas extraction, uh, or for the opening up of a new coal-fired electricity plant, all to try to make sure that um, the climate is not uh, deteriorating further by introducing even more greenhouse gases. Uh, on the other hand, there's also litigation occurring on the side of adaptation, because as we know, climate impacts are already felt and will likely be felt more in the future, uh, which means that in some areas, adaptation is needed also for the benefit of health. And people are going to court uh, to try to convince their governments to increase adaptation actions, including for specific uh, vulnerable groups, uh, because that's another uh, vital element that we see in the litigation area uh, specifically, is that uh, minority groups of different kinds uh, feel that their interests are overlooked in uh, climate governance. Uh, and they are using, again, their human rights to go to court and say, don't forget us, uh, please take our interests into account, take our rights into account, and take action that is sufficiently protective of our different human rights, including uh, the right to health. Um, as said, uh, these climate litigation cases, they are uh, ongoing uh, around the world, and I'll give uh, a bit of an overview in a minute. But uh, I first wanted to give you two examples of how these climate cases are leading actually to uh, uh, quite big impacts and also structural change. Not everywhere, but there are cases that are very successful. And in particular, I wanted to highlight uh, two uh, that are a bit closer to home for me. Uh, the one is the first one is a, a big landmark case that was one of the first cases that really challenged uh, successfully in Europe on human rights grounds. Uh, mitigation aims of the Dutch government. Uh, this is the Urgenda case, uh, whereby uh, Urgenda as an environmental NGO, and initially also 900 individual applicants, uh, went to court in the Netherlands complaining that the Dutch government had reduced its climate ambitions for 2020, saying that it just wanted to reduce emissions by 17% compared to uh, 1990. And the litigants were of the opinion that this 17% target was not really safe. It was not enough. They had evidence or they had arguments that according to international climate science and also political agreements, it would have been necessary to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by at least 25% by 2020 in order to really stay on track for mitigating climate change adequately. Um, the case was in large part based on uh, the right to life. Uh, and the right to private life in Article 2 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And uh, the Dutch courts accepted this argument. And they said that um, this is not uh, something that is merely for the political realm to decide. Uh, we are deciding based on legal standards. Human rights standards are minimum norms, and they really deserve to be protected for everybody. And if there is sufficiently clear and strong evidence that climate action is going to harm these human rights in some way, then courts should be able to set the limits. And the court then mandated as a more structural issue that the Dutch government was obliged to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2020. Um, and the government is abiding by this, uh, this ruling. Um, it's also now drawing this ruling or the lessons of this ruling into the future. So it has really changed uh, the position of the Dutch government on climate action. And in some ways, uh, even uh, becoming a climate leader in EU debates, rather than being maybe a climate laggard in the years before. So it also had bigger ramifications as to how the Netherlands and, and Dutch leaders were presenting themselves uh, on the international level. Um, this Dutch 
climate case has been an example for uh, climate cases in other areas of, of the world, including also in other European countries. Uh, and another case that I want to highlight is a case that was recently decided in Germany, brought by a group of uh, young people. And this is what we also see increasingly in this sphere is that young people are really going to courts complaining about their human rights. Uh, and in this case, it was a group of young German uh, people that uh, used the German constitution, specifically uh, the right to life and uh, the right to physical integrity in Article 1 of the constitution, uh, along with uh, Article 20 of this constitution, the basic law, which is about protecting the foundations of nature for future generations. Uh, and in this uh, case, the German courts also accepted that not acting on climate change sufficiently now, and also delaying the burden of climate change for the future, to the future generations, is unfair. And it's not just unfair, it is also illegal under the German constitution. Um, and also this case led to significant uh, uh, changes in German climate policy, because as a result of the judgment, um, the German government decided to also increase its national climate targets quite significantly. And it's now committing to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 65% by 2030, making it again one of the most ambitious uh, uh, targets that we have in Europe. So we see that these type of uh, climate litigation cases can really force uh, some, some, some structural change, uh, especially at the, at the level of targets, but maybe also in, in then leading to the implementation of some new laws. And the two examples that I give here are from Europe, but there are also examples to give from other areas in the world. Uh, for example, a case in uh, Nepal has led to the adoption of a new Environmental Protection Act and a new Forest Act, uh, but also a case in uh, Pakistan has led to a strengthening of, of adaptation laws or better implementation of adaptation laws uh, and uh, the mandating of setting up a, a, a new climate commission. So also bringing some institutional uh, change. Um, so we see that these, um, these cases, they make a difference in practice. Uh, although perhaps not everywhere, because it also depends on whether or not uh, legal systems uh, are open to these types of cases or whether courts are open uh, to these types of legal arguments. And it also depends on how well the legal arguments are presented. And this is something I will come back to uh, in a minute, because there may also be space to strengthen health-related arguments in climate litigation. So in terms of the overall trend of litigation, we see that uh, there are uh, many cases now being held uh, globally. Uh, there is uh, about 160, 860 cases globally in 55 countries, both in the global north and the global south. And these are increasingly human rights based, but also increasingly health based. Uh, and that includes both uh, complaints about physical health effects and mental health effects, but also people with specific uh, diseases. Uh, and there's one case I wanted to highlight in that, uh, in that respect. Uh, and that is a very landmark case that was held at uh, the UN level. Uh, it was a case brought by Greta Thunberg, along with 16 other young climate activists. Uh, and uh, as part of their case, they argued that their right to life, right to health and rights to culture were at stake. And specifically with respect to their right to health, they offered a lot of detailed comments on both the physical, mental, the physical health aspects uh, experienced by these, uh, these litigants, whether it is uh, cases of malaria, chikungunya, asthma, heat stress, uh, also leading to uh, times in bed, uh, staying at home, missing school, hospitalizations, so really trying to explain how climate change is impacting their lives, uh, as well as the mental health aspects, which Benjamin Schachter rightly said are still sometimes overlooked. And we see, especially in these young people's cases, that actually these mental health aspects are always raised, whether more explicit or implicit, but it's very clear that they are always there. Uh, and they should, they deserve to be better understood from a right to health perspective, uh, and maybe also better leveraged in these type of cases. Um, what we see then there is also that in this case, the health evidence was strongly presented in the sense that it was about presenting sound scientific evidence about health effects of climate change for young people in different parts of the world generally. But there was also a very strong annex with personal testimonies, personal evidence of what type of effects that these young people experienced. Um, and then, although this case was unsuccessful in the sense that it was considered procedurally inadmissible because the children did not first try to test their case in the national legal system, so the case was not dealt with in full, the case was still considered widely successful because it really helped to put the struggles of these young people to the fore 
uh, they bound together as a group and they were able to really present a very compelling narrative about how climate change affects these young people uh, and also how it affects their, their health. Uh, and this is where I uh, will wrap up my presentation because one of the things that uh, we are also interested in with the Groningen Center for Health Law is indeed to try to understand better how these health related arguments in climate cases could be improved not just by improving the legal argumentation, but also by really trying to strengthen the health evidence available and maybe involving public health professionals better in that respect. Uh, and in this sense, uh, the Groningen Center for Health Law and the UK Faculty of Public Health, uh, including uh, with uh, inputs from uh, Farhang uh, Tazip, our host for today, as well as my colleague David Patterson, uh, have published this uh, new guide uh, on uh, climate litigation as a guide for public health professionals whereby we try to introduce uh, this, the, 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 the area of climate litigation to the public health field, but also try to give uh, advice on how public health professionals could get involved. So if you are interested in this topic, I would really ask you to consult the guide and to, to, to get informed. Uh, and in particular, we want to uh, invite public health professionals to help litigators and to work together with legal experts to assemble and to provide credible evidence and to maybe also consider providing evidence, testimonies, uh, whether orally or in a written form. Uh, the practice of, of sending in amicus courier briefs was already mentioned before. But also very importantly, litigation can be used to provide very compelling health narratives. It is not just about the success of that one case for that specific group of people. Litigation, especially when done strategically and together with social mobilization, can really amplify these right to health narratives and really make visible how some people are struggling with climate change in certain ways. And then even if the case is not legally successful in outcome, it may still really uh, help with this, this overall awareness and consciousness of the issue and drive policy change in another way. And in that sense, it would be really great to discuss also a little bit more uh, together also with, uh, with previous speakers to see what could be the benefits of litigation when litigation is not just seen in a narrow way, but really as part of the legal toolbox and as part of social change. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed, uh, Marlies, for your excellent presentation. So you, you've raised a number of issues which, which, uh, which we have. Um, I just wanted to bring in uh, Professor Renzo Guinto, who's actually currently in Singapore. So it's, it's, it's past, past midnight at the moment. Uh, as a public health practitioner, uh, and a public health leader to, to share his insights and reflection on the issues. Uh, Professor Renzo Guzno will be known to, to, to many of you. Um, he, he's professor of the practice of global public health. He's actually inaugural director of the planetary and global program at St. Luke's Medical Center in the Philippines. He's also the chief planetary doctor at the public health lab. And, and so his support around these initiatives would, would, would be very much uh, appreciated. And also as a public health leader, he's an Ob Obama Foundation Asia Pacific leader and Aspen Institute New Voices fellow and many, many uh, accolades which, which highlight him as a public health leader. But he's also an academic uh, being part of the Lancet Chatham House Commission on Improving Population Health, the Lancet One Health Commission, uh, working on the Lancet Planetary Health and a number of other issues. And interest Interestingly, uh, he, in 2020, he was included by the Tatler magazine in its list of leaders of tomorrow who are shaping Asia. So I hope he can also support us uh, shaping um, issues around the human rights dimensions uh, globally. Uh, over to you, Renzo, and thank you so much for, for staying up to join us in this conversation. Over to you, Renzo. Thank you very much. And of course, this is a very important conversation that I wouldn't want to miss, you know, and, uh, um, you know, just to add to you the introduction, I'm right now in Singapore, uh, because I just joined the National University of Singapore, where we are building a planetary health initiative uh, for the entire region. Um, you know, I'm the only non-lawyer uh, in the panel, and perhaps uh, since most of our participants here are coming from public health, medicine, uh, you might have uh, a lot of questions and a lot of reflections. So what? You know, what is our role uh, in this uh, nexus of climate change, public health, law, human rights? You know, I'm a physician by training who ventured into public health, then began working on the climate and health nexus and later on expanded my you know, framework 
to now what we call planetary health. I always remind my students, my medical students, we now have two patients, not just the people, but also the planet. And, you know, in trying to advance the health of people and planet, we need a wide array of tools and some of which we've heard, you know, from our experts who are in the room, law, uh, you know, diplomacy and negotiations, uh, uh, you know, human rights, you know, the human rights based, based approach and many others. And, you know, all of these are vital for us to, you know, advance the cause of climate and health. You know, interestingly, before I went to med school by accident, I was actually planning to pursue a pre-law degree. So now my involvement in this, uh, you know, uh, discussion, this conversation is um, as if I'm, you know, being uh, brought back to my earlier uh, aspiration. You know, it's uh, it just, uh, uh, you know, uh, turned um you know, it, it just uh, went back, you know, to that uh, original vision. And I think in this day and age, we in the public health sphere, uh, you know, cannot escape from these difficult uh, and important uh, arenas. As mentioned already, I come from a country, the Philippines, that is at the top or one of the top countries in the world in terms of climate vulnerability. The Philippines has been very active in international climate negotiations. I myself was in COP28 in, in Dubai, where our government, uh, you know, made uh, some important commitments, especially for climate and health. We were uh, the 80th country to join WHO's Alliance for Transformative Action on Climate and Health. And um, the Philippines also is currently campaigning to host the loss and damage fund, which we also heard a while ago. And, you know, we in the public health community should advocate that the loss and dam damage fund must include health losses and damages. And, you know, again, this is a new fund. This is a new uh, mechanism. And therefore, there is an opportunity for us to really be involved in the crafting and the designing and in cementing health as part of its core business. Um, and, you know, I come from the con a country that is already uh, facing the health impacts of climate change. Right now, my, uh, my work really looks into uh, how to, uh, you know, build climate resilient health systems and to also generate the evidence on the health impacts of climate change, how it's impacting health systems, but ultimately how it's worsening or exacerbating existing health inequities. We heard from Alicia a while ago, you know, e equity and equality, and, and that really is at the heart of what we're talking about. Um, and also, um, you know, our country is still, you know, in the process of uh, trying to achieve universal health care for our citizens. And we know that climate change is going to threaten the progress that many countries in the world uh, have been making when it comes to achieving universal health care, health for all, uh, and even the United Kingdom, which has uh, a universal health care system, uh, perhaps should be now paying attention to climate and how it can lead to long lasting implications, not only on population health, but also in health services, in health systems. So, you know, I just gave that background to, I guess, provide uh, an example for our public health colleagues here that, you know, we need to start thinking about our work and how it connects with climate and what should we be doing in terms of, again, advancing this cause in addressing climate change to protect our people's health. And I just want to summarize everything that I learned from this very rich conversation um, I think what we want to achieve is to build a healthy global population living and flourishing within planetary boundaries. One of our lawyers also mentioned the planetary boundaries concept. And I just want to leave uh, seven uh, builds that we need to do as public health professionals. From my perspective, I'll try to be very, very quick. One is we need to build and even rebuild our values. It requires deep introspection within our sector within our sector. We need to examine our enduring values in public health, equity, for example, which has been repeatedly mentioned already. But also, is it time for us to embrace new values to advance planetary health, such as environmental sustainability? Should it now be 
uh, a core part of our healing mission, or even intergenerational equity, responsibility, and solidarity. Public health for the longest time has been thinking only about the health of people who are living today. But how about the health of people who are yet to live 100 years from now? Is that part of the core business of public health or even planetary health? The second build is we need to build our capacity individually, institutionally, intersectorally. And we've heard already, for example, the new toolkit uh, on uh, litigation. You know, I think that should be required reading for all of us in public health. WHO has an online course on the COP negotiations for health professionals. Uh, and in a month's time, we here in Southeast Asia will be conducting a workshop for health professionals on how to be meaningfully involved in the negotiations around the new plastic treaty, you know, under the auspices of UNEP. So that's second, you know, build our capacity. We need to build relationships and connections. You know, preparing and filing a case uh, in a court, you know, takes a lot of time and effort or developing the political strategy. And so we need to find the right allies, you know, our lawyer friends, human rights professionals, climate activists, you know, because we're already very busy in the in our work in healthcare and public health. And so we need to, uh, you know, seek help from colleagues who know this, uh, you know, business better. We need to build the evidence. And when we say evidence, it's not just the, the statistics, but also the stories, the lived experiences of patients and communities that we serve, and also the evidence around the solutions because if we're going to advocate for change, we need to not only provide a diagnosis, we also need to show the solutions, the management. You know, uh, now I'm speaking like a physician. But we also need to build climate resilient and low carbon health systems. We need to walk the talk, set an example. We cannot be a sector advocating for the right to health and the right to a healthy environment for our patients, but we're also violating their rights through our own pollution and through our lack of preparedness and resilience. It will affect our credibility uh, if we do not uh, build you know, resilience and uh, environmental sustainability within our sector. I have two more builds. Build the movement, the advocacy, the social movement. Let's engage the communities. Let's ensure there's diversity in this movement. Hopefully, there will be more people from my time zone to be part of these international conversations, more allies from Asia and the Global South, and meaningful engagement with indigenous communities. And finally, build it locally. You know, the tendency is for us to talk about global governance, the treaties, the negotiations. That's important. And we have friends here who are already working in that battlefield. But climate and health is a local issue as well. And we need to localize the campaign. We need to take advantage of our local courts. We need to, you know, mobilize our communities and craft laws and municipal order ordinances that will help us build a healthy, sustainable, and just world. So those are my seven builds. I hope that uh, we're now energized and empowered to build a healthy and sustainable future for all. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ren. So can I get on the panel, everybody together now to, for a few minutes? Uh, Heather, can we have everybody now, please? Uh, thank you very much in these, uh, Renzo, for definitely, and I noticed your background, Sing Health, and you've definitely sung us health and uh, the human rights, but I think we need a choir here, really, and this needs to be a global choir of public health lawyers, public health uh, lawyers, ethicists, a whole lot of, so we need a real choir to, to tackle this, and this is such a massive task that we, we need every beauty and I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm be delighted you are now part of the team. I think part of the team is also the 755 people who've actually registered for this webinar. I know a few of you left behind uh, uh, because of the different time zones, because I think we do need to build a coalition around this issue. Unfortunately, because of the time frames and so on, we won't be able to have a detailed uh, hardly any uh, panel discussion all around. But, but while each of the members of the panel are thinking, uh, around sort of a one minute, not more than sort of a closing remarks around this issue. I just want to do some housekeeping keeping stuff. There will be a recording available after this, which will be on YouTube and various websites. 
Um, you will be contacted uh, as a participant this around future activities. Importantly, we will ask you to continue to join us in, in, in this coalition, uh, generating evidence, thinking, and also actions, how to uh, advance this issue. As I said, as part of this specifically around the human, the capacity building angle of this, there will be a series of webinar on different topics and, and, and so on, and a possible summer school, but specifically around the claim climate change and the human right dimensions, I think there is scope for us to collaborate uh, with all the current speakers and also develop a global movement to get shared understanding, but also shared action, which will be delivered locally. I hope this has been meaning, meaningful around that one. So having waffled for a few minutes, uh, I'm going to go in the order which we, we did that, uh, asking each of our, our distinguished panelists and, and speakers to, to, to say something. Um, Alicia, would you like just to briefly reflect for, 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 for very briefly and then um, just to close the, the meeting? Sure, Farhan. First of all, I'm, I, I found the conversation and the contributions of my co-panelists to be incredibly stimulating and interesting, and I learned a lot. I'd like to close with this because I made some remarks that were to provoke thoughts, to issue cautions, etc. I want to underscore that this is the struggle of our time and I am fully committed and on board and any words of caution I issued were in the spirit of trying to be constructive and helpful. Um, I think that just as civil rights and in, when I began economic and social rights and I thought health was a very acute reflection of inequalities and injustices, patterns of health, climate change and environmental, the right to a healthy, uh, sustainable environment is, is the cause of our time and we absolutely do need to build a movement across fields and across borders. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Alicia. Your questions will be answered. We we, we actually have I've, I've got all the chat and the things. So the people who've taken time to ask specific questions, we will answer them and we'll be in contact with you. So apologies for not asking very, very useful questions. For, for example, and the right to protest and a number of other issues I was hoping would, would come on. I think the right to protest is, is the women's movement is a good example of, of that. I'm not saying we should protest, we should break the law in case there's someone listening to our conversation uh, um, from, 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 from somewhere. Uh, but, but, but I think we need to reflect on how to achieve change. Ben, briefly to you, please. Thank you. And, and maybe just a couple of quick points. Uh, one is, is I think the, the importance of uh, the whole of society rights-based approach. I, I re referred to the findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in, in this regard. Um, we need everybody uh, to, to attempt to tackle this crisis and its impacts. Um, and we should be very clear the impacts are already here and that requires that um, you know, remedy be provided. It requires accountability uh, for, for people who have contributed to the crisis. And that's part of what you know the, the human rights-based approach brings to this picture. Um, there are a lot of questions about the efficacy of existing mechanisms, about you know, relationships between different areas of law. Um, look, we need all of these mechanisms and more. Uh, and, and so that's the, the way we approach this is, you know, there are different sort of arrows in our, our quiver or tools in our toolkit. Um, so the UNFCCC is a space. Litigation is another. Uh, the environmental justice movement, which is so inspiring, achieved so much over, over you know, hundreds of, of years um, and, and includes all different parts of society. Um, it is so critical to the to this work um, and to this effort and protecting them, right? Which is is part of the, the you know, rights based approach and and you know all people have rights to to participate, access to information, and freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly, etc. It's so important. So that's it. Thank you, Ma Ma Maya. Just briefly. 
Yes, uh, very briefly. Thank you, everyone, for the, the the session today. And I just wanted to underline the importance of of the narratives. And Renzo, I loved you know what you're thinking in your new institute about health of people, health of planet, having those interwoven narratives. And I just wanted to underline you know the importance of the latest Earth system science, which is about diagnosing what is happening to the Earth system, the shared Earth system that all of humanity shares. And I think a number of you echoed or, or, or like underlined sort of the values shift, which we likely have to do across various sectors, be it public health. Um, and just to that point, because a number of people have mentioned corporations and we are working with the most progressive pro corporations in the world that sometimes they're medium sized corporations who have gone through this values shift and they're an energetic, incredible community to work with. And then just a last point about enforcement and accountability. I saw some comments or questions in the chat at the, how to hold government strategic litigation at the national level, absolutely fundamental. Also the international level, the International Court of Justice case brought by youth originally and then through the General Assembly. And I just want to make the point that in terms of our international architecture, we have options. <laughs> we can take, take steps forward for accountability, for enforcement, to hold various actors to account. And that is just work that, that can be catalyzed and pushed forward in, in using strategic smart coalitions and other mechanisms. Thank you very much. Marlies, just briefly. Thank you. I just want to say again, thank you for having me as part of this very inspiring and rich panel. I am very much motivated myself by seeing so many people interested in the webinar and joining the webinar. Uh, and I also want to reiterate what was already said. I think what will be vital in this, this moment in time of trying to combat climate change is that the message that something needs to be done is amplified. And with that message, hopefully also the action will come. Uh, personally, uh, my focus area has been this litigation angle. But litigation is only just one part of the toolbox. It really requires a broad social movement of all these different actors working together uh, across academia, across practice, across health, across law, across different disciplines. Um, so let this be uh, again one step in uh, in that uh, collaboration. Thanks. Renzo, I, 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 no, no, before asking you, I'll just ask Lynn to say a few few closing words, and I'll get you to close, Renzo, because you, 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 I think have, I, I now know your skill set, uh, but, but very, very briefly. So, so Lynn, on behalf of the OCHR and faculty and and our partners, I think uh, we just want to uh, thank the panel, right? Yeah, briefly. thank you so much. Um, I really don't have much to add. I've, uh, as Alicia was saying, um, there was a lot of learning here. Uh, extremely stimulating and thank you all very much. Um, I think one big takeaway for me, I'd written global movement as my sort of uh, takeaway. We've had a lot of uh, what the pieces could be. Um, and when we think especially of uh, our youth, they're a big, big, big constituency, very, very motivated uh, and, and they're indefatigable really. Um, so, I think what we need to, to be doing is, is putting more strength into that, um, how we develop a global movement. There's the, I think the public uh, and medical, um, the public health uh, academics movement is already one such uh, movement. Um, and I think we need to see what, what the building blocks of the whole uh, could look like, how we can cohere around the issues um, uh, for, for greater effect. So that's those were those were really my sort of uh, thank parting you. thoughts. Thank, thank you, you very much indeed, Renzo. Did, um, I, I get you to close on behalf of the, of the team, uh, and your comments will be in the recording. Although now we've gone over uh, over the end, and thank you very much indeed, Ruth. Uh, over to you, and you just make the closing statement. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, and I'll be very quick. You started Farhang with by remembering Paul Farmer, and I'm reminded by. Uh, uh, his another book, it's entitled To Repair the World. I think that's what we're trying to do, to repair the world. And I think we now have the tools in public health, from law, etc. And we just need to uh, come together and use these tools again to repair the world. So I'll stop. I'll, I'll end my remarks with that. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, good night and thank you very much indeed for all the participants for staying on and thank you very much for the excellent panelists. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Farhan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. No, no. <laughs> Thanks very much, panel. Uh, we did go over time. We didn't have time for to have the panel discussion. 
Uh, but I think we're just laying out the stall this time, and hopefully at the other webinars and all that we can we can sort of have more of a discussion and and, and all that sort of stuff. So uh, uh, if you're just laying out that this is this was the first one, and 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 uh, specifically, uh, I think we'll email you because there are about two hundred people still online, so we can email each other to to thank and have proper coffee and croissants sometimes soon. Thank you very much indeed. Good night, everybody. And, thank and, you. And thank you for all your support. Bye.